the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Winston Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age, unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostle Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Sounding the Alarm and deals with chapter 16 of the book I'm reading for the moment, All Roads Lead to Rome. Six, chapter 16 of 21 chapters to go, so we are at the closing chapters of this book and it gets better with every page that I read, I can tell you. I so much enjoyed reading this for the first time in preparation. You know, I don't prepare any comments or something that will come up just at the moment when I read it, uh, spontaneously. But, um, of course, I read that at least once before, so that sometimes when there are difficult words, <laughs> I hope I won't stumble on them when I do the reading as I do right now. And this chapter 16 is called Sounding the Alarm, and, well, in a... In a, in, a, in a sense, this is exactly what my YouTube channel is all about. This is, in a sense, what my whole ministry is all about. This is, in a sense, what people like Tom Fress with Inquisition Update, who I support in any way that I can, are all about. That we are like, um, what, do, what do you say for that, like the watchman on the wall, you know? And uh, when the enemy is in sight, we also have to sound the alarm. Today, most watchmen have gone to sleep because of the ecumenical movement, because they do not believe or they do not follow the Bible. They follow rather the teachings of men than the teachings of God. But there are still some people who are sounding the alarm and um, one of them, of course, is Michael de Semlian when he wrote this book, All Roads Lead to Rome. That was an alarm sounder like James Edgar Wiley when he wrote Roman Civil Liberty in the 19th century, like Henry Grattan Guinness when he wrote Romanism and the Reformation in the 19th century. Those books are there to sound the alarm. Those books are there to wake us from the sleep that we have been fallen into. I don't know where it is said, but somewhere I read that years ago, every generation has again to fight for the freedoms the generation before achieved, because otherwise they will lose these freedoms without even recognizing it. When you look after all that happened, since 9-11, for example, which is now 15 years. 
people have forgotten what happened in uh, Pearl Harbor, which is now how long ago? 70 something years. That's why 9 11 was possible. And the ecumenical movement started with Vatican II in the 1960s, and now we are more than 50 years later than that, and people have forgotten. They have returned to Rome because there was no sounding the alarm. Uh, well, there was, but people were quite busy with other things. So let's go on reading page 167 in the book, if you read along, and see what the author has to say on sounding the alarm. I just love this chapter, I can tell you. From the Catholic Research Information Bureau, a publication from 1987, we read, quote, No right-minded Protestant could place his trust in the promises of the Vatican. A church for all seasons, semper eadem, always the same, but adaptable, compliant and blending into her surrounds, she adopts the cause which will win her ascendancy. These are her politics and her diplomacy, and this is her ecumenism." Unquote. No right-minded Protestant could place his trust in the promises of the Vatican. Where are all these so-called right-minded Protestants today? I ask myself. The Roman Church is frequently described in Protestant literature as a lamp in adversity, a fox when in equality, and a tiger when in the ascendancy. British Prime Minister W. E. Gladstone had sounded a strong warning to pros posterity about the designs of this great institution. In 1874, and just four years after Rome had lost her territorial possessions, he wrote, quote, Individual servitude, however abject, will not satisfy the Latin Church. The state must also be a slave. Unquote. Gladstone, who was a leader of the British Empire at the height of its global power and influence, as well placed, <coughs> was well placed to recognize papal ambitions. The author only mentions that four years after Rome had lost her territorial possessions in 1874, but that's also four years after Rome announced papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council with Pius IX. So also were Prime Ministers Sir Robert Peel and Benjamin Disraeli. Peel had predicted after the 1829 Emancipation Act that equality would not be enough and that the Roman Catholic Church would be satisfied by nothing but ascendancy. Disraeli, later in the century, saw it clearly enough. Quote, your empire and your liberties are more in danger at this moment than when Napoleon's army of observation was encamped at Boulogne. Unquote. He observed. Bismarck's experience in Europe was no different. The papacy, said Bismarck, has ever been a political power with which, with the greatest audacity and with the most momentous consequences, has interfered in the affairs of this world. Unquote. Bismarck being very much aware of the Jesuit order, who intermingled in all the political systems that they infiltrated during the time. That's why in 1872 Bismarck kicked the Jesuits out of Germany. Completely. Earlier in the 19th century historian Lord Macaulay had written, quote, The experience of 1200 eventful years, the ingenuity, ingenuity and patient care of 40 generations of statesmen have improved the policy of the Church of Rome to such perfection that among the contrivances which have been devised for deceiving and controlling mankind, 
it occupies the highest place. Unquote. In the 17th century, philosopher Thomas Hobbes had identified this policy in his famous description of the Roman Catholic Church. Quote, the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Unquote. Doesn't it say about the Roman Catholic Church in Revelation, I am a widow? Yeah, the papacy is no other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Adam Smith in his Wealth of Nations also added his warning for posterity. Quote, the constitution of the Church of Rome may be considered the most formidable combination that was ever formed against the authority and security of civil government as well as against the liberty, reason, and happiness of mankind." Unquote. How about the pursuit of happiness in the United States of America? How does that go along with the Church of Rome? Exactly. They don't go along. Those who are sounding the alarm today, speaking of the 1990s when this book was written, seek to show that ecumenism is the up-to-date contrivance for deceiving and controlling mankind. The Catholic Church's pragmatic attitude to ecumenism and the separated brethren at home and abroad is very well illustrated by a Daily Telegraph article on Antichrist Pope John Paul II's visit to La Paz in Bolivia in April 1987. Speaking to the meeting of 39 Catholic bishops, of whom only 12 were native Bolivians, the Pope warned against the proselytizing activities of sects, which have multiplied recently in Bolivia. These so-called fundamentalist sects, which are sowing confusion. Unquote. There is no doubt his remarks referred to Bible-believing Christians. In Ireland, the Roman Catholic Church has not joined in with the new ecumenical structure, but retained observer status. When the Roman Catholic Church is in the minority, as she is in Britain, her policy has ever been to join in and seek to control and observe those with whom she has made common cause. When she is in the majority, as she is in Ireland, she is quite different. She holds herself aloof and seeks to demolish those who disagree with her. But Rome has been reassuring about her intentions. According to Cardinal Sunens, quote, the Second Vatican Council closed the age of counter-reformation. I'm not sure about that, but let's read on. Obviously, the climate has not done away with the real doctrinal differences, and there are some who say, the glaciers may melt, but the Alps will remain. We cannot share this pessimistic view. Even now, men are digging into the sides of the mountain, challenging its resistance and preparing tunnels." Unquote. The Second Vatican Council closed the age of counter-reformation? Really? Counter-reformation will only close when the Reformation is annihilated from the face of the earth. And that is the goal of the Jesuits, and that is the goal of the Second Vatican Council with that ecumenism. They do the same thing they have done in the 300s. In the 300s when Christianity was so-called made the state religion of Rome. Infiltration. And by that infiltration, subversion. That's their goal. It always was, it is, and it always will be that way. The Second Vatican Council closed the age of counter-reformation? Well, why then do we still have the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the continuation of the Office of the Holy Inquisition, if the counter-reformation age is closed, if 
there is no persecution of Protestants, if there is no persecution of heretics, as we can read in the Directorium Studor, uh, in the uh, Directorium Studorum, like I read in Rulers of Evil, chapter eight. Have a look at that. <coughs> the Second Vatican Council closed the age of Counter Reformation. I happen to disagree. Maybe officially, but not internally for the Roman Catholic Church. Open policy does not reflect the secret policy of the Antichrist. The Cardinal, anyway, was continuing here in the, in the book, the Cardinal was careful to deal with accusations and suspicions about spiritual and temporal domination. Quote, there is nothing that will free the papacy more completely from all suspicions of absolutism and authoritarianism than the application in daily life of primacy of service, which will be more effective than doctrinal discussion. Unquote. Without temporal power, the Church of Vatican II has but one ambition, to aid the world in freeing men from ignorance, mistrust and traditional, traditional hatred, and to aid the building of the humanism of tomorrow, combining all the power of the forces of peace. Unquote. Yeah, without temporal power, the Roman Catholic Church has all the temporal power. It has even more than it probably ever had in this world, because it not only reigns over what was known as the Holy Roman Empire in the Dark Ages, but it, rolls over, it rules over more than 80 or 90 percent of the complete world at this moment. Without temporal power, Vatican II has but one ambition, yeah, but the, the Vatican has temporal power. Okay, the next part that we go into this uh, little chapter sounding the alarm is called Billy Graham. Probably a name most of you, my listeners, know. Many evangelical leaders today share General Sunan, uh, Car excuse me, Cardinal Sunan's ecumenical optimism. Billy Graham felt John F. Kennedy's election as president had, quote, helped relations between the churches and created a better understanding between Protestant and Catholic churches in America, unquote. When Graham was conversing with Cardinal Cushing on network television in October 1964, Cushing said to him, quote, You've made a great contribution to the ecumenical spirit because you've tossed the banner bearing the fact that Christians agree on more things than they disagree on, unquote. And this is, of course, it was said in 1964. This was in the middle of Vatican II where the whole policy was about to tell the people that we should only see the things that we agree on and never the things that we disagree on. It's been the policy of Vatican, of the Vatican of the Roman Catholic Church ever since Vatican II. It's the policy of Pope Francis today. Never talk about things that separate us, but only talk about things that we have in common, that we agree on, for the common good. Huh? Now more recently Billy Graham has gone further in enforcing and contributing to the ecumenical process. In 1979 he expressed to the Associated Press his hope that Pope John Paul's II visit to the United States will launch a new wave of spiritual revival. Quote, those who received Christ at the Billy Graham Crusades, at which so many in the past found Christ, were told to go back to their churches. Roman Catholics, who come forward in response to the message, are handed over to the local clergy of the Church of Rome for follow-up. This has been the standard practice of Billy Graham Association for many years. Now, in January 1981, Billy Graham described the Pope as, quote, the greatest moral leader 
of the world and the world's greatest evangelist, unquote. Yeah, and Pope Francis was made man of the year in 2013, even the, the year that he was just elected. Do you see any resemblance of that? Hmm? Dr. Graham's enthusiasm for close working with Roman Catholicism has been very, a very influential factor in the advance of ecumenical unity in the 1980s. Friend and confident to every United States president since Harry Truman and spiritual counsel to a number of them, including George Bush in the 1990s today, Billy Graham is regularly featured in Times Magazine Top 10 Most Respected Men. He is conspicuously careful not to cause offense or to adopt controversial positions which might forfeit his close relationship with kings and political leaders or his near universal popularity. For example, when asked by the BBC radio program Sunday, about Nancy Reagan's consultation of an astrologer in, revela in relation to President Reagan's diary, Dr. Graham replied, quote, Astrology is all right, as long as it is not taken too seriously. Unquote. Well, he surely knows better, or should have known better, for the Bible says otherwise. The scripture makes very clear the source of the spirit behind astrology, that it is forbidden by God and that those who practice it are heading for damnation. And we can read that, for example, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 47, verses 13 and 14, quote, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame, there shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it." Unquote. The Apostle Paul certainly could not have spoken more clearly to us about this kind of compromise. So, Mr. Graham, do you know what Paul said? In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, quote, Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Unquote. How about that, Mr. Graham? How about that, you evangelibellies who follow the teaching of people like Mr. Graham and like the Roman Catholics, instead of just comparing what the Bible says, what God says? Yet, when Billy Graham began his ministry as an in, uh, itinerant uh, evangelist, he proclaimed that the three greatest dangers facing the world were Islam, Roman Catholicism, and communism. <laughs> Let me make a little comment here. Islam is the greatest danger facing the world? Well, Islam is a child of the Roman Catholic Church. So, that makes the Roman Catholic Church enemy number one. Catholicism? Roman Catholicism, he rightly says here? That's true. And communism? Well, that's also founded by the Jesuits, meaning by the Roman Catholic Church. So, Scrap Islam, scrap communism, and what you have to keep is simple Roman Catholicism. It is Roman Catholicism that is the greatest danger facing the world. Not three greatest dangers, no distraction, just Roman Catholicism. The Church of Antichrist, the seat of the son of perdition, the man of sin the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. In more than 40 years he has moved a long way from this position, Billy Graham that is. Having been given tremendous publicity by the Roman Catholic media, Baron William Randolph Hearst and his powerful group of newspapers, and later on having accepted an honorary doctorate from a 
Jesuit seminary, Mr. Graham clearly departed from the distinctive evangelical stance with which he began. In 1972 he received the Catholic International Franciscan Award for quote, his contribution to true ecumenism. Unquote. The Welsh publication Rallying Cry summarized what had taken place. Quote, the tragic decline of this Christian hero is exposed. One which began way back in 1954. Then, or even earlier, he let go his love for Christian doctrine and a desire to contend for it in favor of a, of a more popular appeal. No doubt, American big business behind the Billy Graham evangelistic organization argued against the narrow view which a doctrinal appreciation would give him. In big business, success means riding high upon tidal waves of popularity. Thus, Billy Graham was obliged to reach out beyond the limited confines of God's sheepfolds to the wider acres where goats graze and wolves prey. Unquote. President of the Evangelical Theological Society, Dr. Richard Pierrat, described Billy Graham as the, quote, chief force in promoting ecumenism among evangelicals, unquote. American Bible teacher Dr. Charles Woodbridge said much the same in a solemn warning to the evangelist, quote, If you persist in making common cause with those that deny the word of God, and thus in minimizing in sharp the sharp line of distinction between those that are loyal and those who are disloyal to the scriptures, it is my strong opinion that you will be known as the great divider of the Church of Christ of the 20th century. Unquote. And the Bible confirms this in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Quote, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you have learned, and avoid them." Unquote. In an interview with United States News, US News and World Report, in December 1988, Dr. Graham said, quote, World travel and getting to know the clergy of all denominations has helped mold me into an, into an ecumenical being. <laughs> He is not a Protestant, he is an ecumenical being. Huh? We are separated by theology and, in some, uh, some instances, by culture and race. But all of that means nothing to me anymore. Unquote. He is calling himself an ecumenical being. What do you think Christ would call him? He paved the way for diplomatic relations between the United States and the Vatican, something that had never happened before. Well, that's not true because there were relationships, diplomatic relationships between the United States and the Vatican, but those were ceased to existence in 1867 after the American government learned that the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuit order was behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And now, of course, it all went back because also of the intermingling of Billy Graham. He paved the way for diplomatic relations between the United States and the Vatican to come again. And that is in 1984. And for that you can read in confirmation, of course, Time magazine from 1992 about the so-called Holy Alliance between then US President Reagan and Antichrist, Pope John Paul II, for the demise of communism. A letter by Billy Graham sent to President Reagan's National Security Advisor, William P. Clark, was quoted in the Chicago Sun-Times as saying, quote, If anyone can do it and get away with it, it is Mr. Reagan. Unquote. The famous evangelist's visit to Russia and East European countries had the approval, backing and diplomatic enhancement of the Vatican. 
and thus it is not surprising to learn that those behind the Iron Curtain, whom the Pope and former Archbishop Runcie have described as fundamentalists, felt betrayed by Billy Graham's apparent accommodation of communism and his disavowal of their plight during those visits. Before his July 1989 mission to Hungary, three protestant pastors called on him to repent for collaborating with oppressive dictatorships in Eastern Europe. In an open letter dated 20th of April 1989, Giozo Dobnach, Gabor Ivanyi and Geza Mimeth expressed sadness that on previous visits to Eastern Europe, especially to Romania in 18, 1985, Billy Graham was, quote, manipulated by dark powers, unquote. He was quoted as saying that the Ceausescu regime had, quote, resolved all nationality questions and guaranteed complete religious freedom for every religious community, unquote. The three ministers noted that at the time it was well known that the country's leadership was causing immeasurable suffering and brutality and brutally violating human rights. The task of the faithful, the pastors declared, is not to protect the oppressor, but to express unambiguously solidarity with the oppressed. The preaching of the gospel of Christ is incompatible with political falsehood. Louis Palau is also working with Roman Catholics in his crusades and his 1987 New Zealand crusade was the first time the Catholic Church has ever backed a major evangelical mission. Unquote. We can read that from the Australian Challenge Weekly, 18th of April, 1986. Now in the next part of this chapter we are going to have another view of evangelism. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was not one of those who could go along with this view of evangelism. In fact, at the Second National Assembly of Evangelicals in 1966, he parted company with, another evangelical with other evangelical leaders, including Jim Pecker and John Stott, over the issue of ecumenism. The first NEAC conference at Kiel the following year made public the gulf between had the gulf which had been opened up among evangelicals by this issue. Dr. Lloyd-Jones spoke out boldly about the magnitude of, of the problem as he saw it. He told his congregation at Westminster Chapel, listen closely, quote, I remind you that the Protestant reformers were not just bigoted zealots or fools. Their eyes were opened by the Holy Spirit, Luther, Calvin, Knox, all of them. They saw this horrible monstrosity depicted in the Bible and the warning against it. At the risk of even losing their lives, they stood up and protested. They confronted Rome. The Roman Catholic Church is a counterfeit, a sham. It represents prostitution of the worst and most diabolical kind. It is indeed a form of the Antichrist. It is to be rejected and denounced, but, above all, it is to be countered. And there is only one thing that can counter it, and that is a biblical, doctrinal Christianity. A Christianity that merely preaches come to Christ or come to Jesus cannot stand before Rome. Probably what that will do ultimately will be to add to the numbers belonging to Rome. People who hold evangelistic campaigns and say, are you Roman Catholics? Go back to your church. Are denying New Testament teaching. We must warn them. We must warn them. What's the chapter called? Sounding the alarm, right? It is our duty as Bible-believing Christians to warn the deceived brethren. This sermon of Dr. Lloyd-Jones was but an echo sounding down the centuries. 
of the bold and fearless exposition of the world from the pulpit. Sounds of the trumpet increasingly muted during this century. Now speaking in the, in the 1880s, Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness sounded a strong, clear note typical of his time. And we can read that in the book that he wrote called Romanism and the Reformation. And I can only advise you, if you are not familiar with that book, download that book as a free PDF on the internet or get the book in a printed copy at your home and study it and read it. Romanism and the Reformation has been read by Tom Fress and I am uploading all the readings on my channel. There are some 30 readings and I'm just at number 10 for the moment because I cannot get that fast. But when you are reading, when you are following Tom's reading of that book via my videos or I can also um, I also put a link into the description box of the video where you can go to the initial broadcast and there you have them all so then you don't have the video but you have all the broadcast and you can listen to that and you read the book for yourselves I can only tell you that book next to the King James Bible is the most important a protestant ever should have in his possession and should have read Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Gretton Guinness now let's see what Henry Gretton Guinness had to say as the author says here um, speaking in the 1880s Great Gretton Guinness sounded a strong clear note typical of his time quote I see the great apostasy. I see the desolation of Christendom. I see the smoke and ruins. I see the reign of monsters. I see those vice gods that Gregory the Seventh, that Innocent the Third, that Boniface the Eighth, that Alexander the Sixth, that Gregory the Thirteenth, that Pius the Ninth. I see their long succession. I hear their insufferable blasphemies. I see their abominable lives. I see them worshipped by blinded generations, bestowing hollow benedictions, bartering, lying indulgences, creating a paganized Christianity. I see their liveried slaves, their shaven priests, their celibate confessors, I see the infamous confessional, the ruined woman, the murdered innocents. I hear the lying absolutions, the dying groans. I hear the cries of the victims. I hear the anathemas, the curses, the thunders of the interdicts. I see the racks. I see the dungeons. I see the stakes. I see that inhumane Inquisition, those fires of Smithfield, those butcheries of St. Bartholomew, that Spanish armada, those unspeakable dragonates, that endless train of wars, that dreadful multitude of massacre. I see it all. And in the name of the ruin it has brought in the church and in the world, in the name of the truth it has denied, the temple it has defiled, the God it has blasphemed, the souls it has destroyed, in the name of the millions it has deluded, the millions it has slaughtered, the millions it has damned. With holy confessors, with noble reformers, with innumerable martyrs, with the saints of ages, I denounce it as the masterpiece of Satan as the body and soul and essence of Antichrist." Unquote. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, another gifted 19th century preacher, was every bit as firm about the true nature of Rome, and this had much to do with his parting of the ways with the Baptist Union. Quote, 
It is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the Popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name, because it wounds Christ, because it robs Christ of his glory, because it puts sacramental efficacy in the place of his atonement and lifts a piece of bread in the place of the Saviour and a few drops of water in place of the Holy Ghost and puts a fallible man like ourselves up as the vicar of Christ on earth. If we pray against it, because it is against him, we shall love the persons though we hate their errors. We shall love their souls, though we loathe and detest their dogmas. And so the breath of our prayers will be sweetened, because we turn our faces towards Christ when we pray." Unquote. With Billy Graham back in England in 1989, Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland's clerk to the Synod, Rev. Donald MacLean's comment in his letter to the Times on the 11th of November 1988 still deserves careful consideration. Quote, the ecumenical movement which you praise is the greatest disaster to affect the Christian Church this century. It has reduced the professing churches of this country to a collection of bloodless, spineless and boneless organizations which can hardly raise a whimper on the sight of Christ and his truth. Small wonder that evil progress as it does. And spiritual darkness becomes more intense as the years go by you appear to regard a body of professing Christians of sober conduct and deep spirituality of mind as fanatical and bigoted. If this be so, then the eminent men of God such as John Knox in Scotland, John Calvin and Martin Luther on the continent and Archbishop Cranmer in England were bigots in their contests with the errors of popery. We are glad to be in such company." Unquote. The Baptist Confession of Faith, following on from the Westminster Confession, had its 300th anniversary commemorated in 1989. With wonderful clarity it expounds the great doctrines of grace and election, underlining the Lordship and authority of Christ, and declares, Quote, that the Pope of Rome is that man of sin and son of perdition that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Unquote. Bishop J. C. Ryle, who stood strongly in the Protestant tradition, had no doubt about it. Quote, Unity without truth is useless. When Rome has repealed the decrees of Trent and her additions to the creed, and when she has formally renounced image worship, Mary worship and transubstantiation, then, and not until then, will it be time to talk of reunion with her. Till then, I call on all Christians to resist to the death this idea of reunion with Rome." Unquote. This was quite a heavy, even though quite short, chapter of the book All Roads Lead to Rome, called Sounding the Alarm. I don't know if I read that very well from Henry Gretton Guinness, but my heart opened when I read that in preparation, and I read it in German to my mother, and I almost cried. I love the book, Romanism and the Reformation. That's only me. But I can only advise every so-called Protestant to have a look at it. 
and also the teachings of uh, Spurgeon. So this finishes the reading of chapter 16 of All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian and next time we will go to chapter 17 which is called The Pace of Ecumenical Progress. I thank you all for watching the video, for listening, maybe for commenting also. Sharing. Don't forget, my videos are absolutely free of copyright. Share them, re-upload them wherever you can, whenever you feel like it. I have really problems understanding people from YouTube watching videos like this, giving it the thumbs up and not sharing it on their own channel when they don't have any other videos on there anyway. This message, brothers and sisters, has to get out. Why? Because we are sounding the alarm. Without us there is no alarm. Without us there is no protest. We have to do it. All of us. Are we the body of Christ? So, thanks for watching. Until next time. Chocolate 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. Bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world like XE or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc, etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.